praise team. It is good to get away, but it's better to come home. What bed do you sleep the best in? Your bed. The table you eat the best at? Your table. The church you worship the best in? Your church. So it's good to be here. Now, uh, I think, was it Smokey and the Bandit that said, we got a long way to go and a short time to get there? Some of you people who survived the 80s. So we, I, just got, I just got to jump in really fast. You're going to look at your sermon outline, uh, Faithful Father Paradox. What is a paradox? Not a paradox. What's a paradox? A paradox, uh, simply a seemingly contradictory statement. Uh, the most paradoxical poem I ever heard, I learned in fourth grade, and I have adapted it. Uh, it's a paradoxical poem. It's a poem that's full of paradoxes. Are you ready? You might have heard it. One bright morning in the middle of the night, two sleeping boys started to fight. Back to back, they faced each other. Silently, they yelled at each other. A deaf policeman heard the noise and came to arrest those two sleeping boys. If you don't believe my lies are true, Asked the blind man. He saw it too. <laughs> Did you learn that in fourth grade? Did you learn that in fourth grade? You didn't? You didn't go to Dalton, did you? You should have. Maybe not. Uh, a paradox. It's something that makes us scratch our heads and go, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. How does that work? How does that work? Let me just tell you, the biblical paradoxes can sound just as crazy as Ask the Blind Man, he saw it too. They can sound just as crazy as that if you listen to it with your earthly ears. Specifically, as a dad on your own, I just want to be crystal clear with today's sermon. As a dad on your own, this will sound crazy. You will not be able to do it. These will not only be difficult, but they will almost be dangerous as we delve in. You see, we need Jesus to help us do the difficult and diffuse the dangerous. We need his Holy Spirit to fill us and to guide us so that we can be the faithful fathers we need to be and reflect the love of God, the ultimate father of us all. So now I'm going to ask you to pray. Lord, help us. I stand before you a flawed father. And perhaps there are a couple other ones out here. Lord, the, these words that are going to be shared today can be so convicting, they can almost be painful. And so I pray that you would strengthen your servant, but also uh, strengthen those servants who hear the words today, and that there would be more of you up here, O oh Lord, than me. I ask this all in Jesus' name. And everybody who's listening says, Amen. Friends, I'm going to do what I told you I would never do to you. I'm going to attempt to preach three sermons at once. Okay? I told you I would never do this to you, but I have to because I resourced the father-son retreat at Camp Luz, and there were three separate sessions, and I tried to pick the one that I liked the best, and I couldn't do it. God said, you got to do all three. I said, I'd never do that, God. He said, you will today, and you will do it really fast. So I want you to buckle in, okay? I'm going to be, read, I'm going to be reading and talking faster. Uh, I just got back from Disney, Space Mountain, okay? I want you to just imagine Space Mountain sermon today because it's going to go fast. But I don't want you to be in the dark, so stay with me as much as you can. Open your Bibles right now to Luke 15. Luke 15, 11 to 32. It would also be helpful if you have your outline open once we get there. Today I'm going to be opening three texts with you that I believe are the most beautiful, powerful, and pivotal scriptures on fatherhood that I have found in the Bible. Our first is likely not only the most beautiful one, but also the best known story in the Bible. Most people know it as the prodigal son. I'm in Luke. See, now you're waiting on me. Uh-oh. Luke chapter 15, I'm going to start in verse 11. 
I've already told you that you can hear uh, about five times as fast as I can actually read. So I'm going to read fast, but you just stay with me. Here we go. Parable of the Lost Son. I'm in Luke chapter 15, uh, verse 11, page 1105 in your student Bible. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth on wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have no food to, sp have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back, safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Take a deep breath. The point godly fathers wrestle with biblical paradoxes such as being strong yet gentle. Being strong yet gentle. How do we do that? I wonder how many, how many dads wrestled their children when they were little? When they were little? Did you wrestle them? Okay, you did. Did it look kind of like this? <laughs> give, give me some volume. Are you done wrestling now? You should grab Daddy. Wrestle him down. Give you him his You wrestle me now? Yeah. Okay, go for it. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Get him. Pin him down. <laughs> Whoa! Oh. <laughs> 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 Upside down! Wow! <laughs> now, the big horse bite! <laughs> <laughs> actually a six minute segment. I only gave you the last minute and we still wrestle at our house now. The only difference is after that first impact that Elliot hits me, 
I just lay on the floor. <laughs> End of video. That's how we roll now. Uh, that was my 14-year-old Elliot when he was three. I would not have been a good dad if I would have just grabbed him by the neck, threw him on the floor and said, ha, you need a strong father. <laughs> that would not have been a good dad, would have it? I needed to be strong and gentle. Godly strength is always tempered with gentleness. Look back at our text, verse 12, the second half. So he divided his fortune. The father had the strength of his fortune and the authority, but he was gently generous, providing for both sons. Now look at verse 20 real quick. Let's play fill in the blank a little bit. Can we do that? Look at verse 20. So he got up and went to his. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with. For him, he. He threw his. Around him and he. Kissed him. Some of you might be sitting there going, that doesn't sound very strong, really? Boy ran away with half of his fortune, brought none of it home, smelling like a pig. Didn't tell him he was coming back. We have a very sad and limited understanding of what true strength is. I don't know what strength it took for that father to get up and go. But he did, with compassion. Friends, that's supernatural strength, strength. But wait, there's more. Verse 28. Look at verse 28 real close. With strength and gentleness, the father enters into the conflict. It's so easy to hide, especially from family or sibling conflict, to say, honey, why don't you go take care of this one? But the father stepped into the conflict. Dad enters it because he loves both of his boys with gentle strength. The everybody application is on your outline. How has your dad been both? How has your dad been both strong and gentle? Are there moments that you can recall when your dad was both strong and gentle with you? Have you thanked him for reflecting the character and the activity of God? Today's a great day to do it. But now there's a daddy application. There's a daddy application. And uh, you'll see dads in parentheses. I have Matthew 5, 5 there. That is uh, in the Beatitudes. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. If there was one word for being strong and gentle, it's meek. When we talk about meekness, the image that the Bible brings us is an image of two oxen pulling a big plow, doing work, power under control. Fathers, we need to embrace a biblical sense of meekness if we want to inherit the world. Indeed, if we want to even inherit our own families. Dad, I would ask you, are you strong yet gentle? Now let's jump to the scariest father story in the entire Bible, in my humble opinion. I'm jumping over to Matthew now. Two books over, you'll get there. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Verses 36 and 46. It's on page 1040 in your student Bible. If you don't know what the student Bible is, come back next week. I'll tell you all about it. Verse 36 to 46. Here we go. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane means place of crushing. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here. Keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, 
may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. I want you to look really hard. I'm going to fill in real soon here, but I want you to look really hard at verses 39, 42, and 44. What in the world is that cup? What is the cup that he is even talking about? Now, we know from the previous series that we went through together before Easter and after Easter, we know that Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what that cup was. It's the cup of hurt. It's the cup of pain. Friends, I believe that cup contains something that you and I can't even imagine because we're not perfect. We've all sinned. We actually deserve that cup. Jesus didn't. But he took it for us. That's so hard to imagine. It's a whole other sermon. But I want you to focus on who is Jesus pleading with? This is scary stuff, folks. Who's he pleading with? His Father. Jesus the Son is saying, I don't want to hurt, but I want what you want. Now I'm going to give you a dangerous fill in the blank. Godly fathers wrestle with biblical paradoxes such as willing to hurt to heal. Willing to hurt to heal. Um, I've told this story before, but it fits, so I'm going to tell it again. Um, how many of you, when your children were young, you would uh, let them, you would take hold of their arms, you would let them run up your legs and flip over? And they would make them giggle and laugh, and so you would have them do it again, and then you'd have them do it faster? Well, I was doing that with my Thad one night before supper. Froom, 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 over and over, loving it, laughing, all of a sudden, froom. And I was like, oh, oh. and just screaming, holding his arm. His, his arm was just flopping. And I'm like, great. I just broke his arm right before supper. This is bad. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And just, he was, he was two or three years old. And it was just flopping. And I'm like, oh, no. And Rebecca came out, and she's like, what did you do? And I said, I think, I don't know. Let's call the doctor. I have a friend who's a doctor. So I called him, and I explained what was happening. And he was like, oh, um, I think you have a radial head subluxation. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> Is that a broken arm? He's like, no, it's a radial head subluxation, also known as nursemaid's elbow. And I said, how do I fix it? And he goes, well, if you didn't break his arm, this is how you do it. What you'll do is, You'll place his arm down on the table, hand up, okay? And then, gently but firmly, you will turn it over. You will hear a click like a light switch, and he will scream like, well, howdy, okay? <laughs> he's going to scream worse than he's screamed up to this point, but within five minutes, he's going to stop screaming and crying, and he's going to start eating his macaroni and cheese. And I'm like, and if it doesn't work, <laughs> then his arm is broken and you need to take him to the ER. And I'm like, right, great. Rebecca, you need to hold his arm. <laughs> mm -mm. So I took my little boy and I held his 
his arm on the table. And he's, uh, 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 you know, just starting to stop. Uh, uh, uh. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. <laughs> it's really not going to be okay. It's going to be awful. <laughs> Click. Like a light switch. <laughs> Screaming. Worst dad in the world. Right there, baby. Screaming. Reaches down, picks up his spoon, starts eating his macaroni and cheese. <laughs> uh. You see, friends, sometimes godly fathers have to be willing to hurt to heal. I did not want to cause my child more hurt, but I believe deep down the hurt could heal him. That this pain had a purpose. God the Father knew that in order to heal the whole world of sin, Jesus would be hurt. In fact, Jesus would be killed. And then, by his resurrection, healing would come. As Jesus was raised to everlasting life on the third day, we can share in that eternal life. Jesus was healed, thus we can be healed. This is really scary. This is really scary, and friends, this is so convicting to me because I, I want you to know that I have not always hurt to heal. Um, there have been times that I have hurt to hurt. In anger, I've not reflected the love of God, but rather the sinfulness of a frustrated father. Maybe you have too. Maybe you have too. You know, it's never too late to confess that to God. But it can be too late to confess it to people. Dads, if you've, if you've hurt to hurt, what a wonderful Father's Day gift to give those you've hurt, if you could just ask them to forgive you. But for the rest of us, for the rest of you, I'd like you to deeply consider how perhaps there's been a time that your dad hurt you to heal you. And maybe even thank him. Now, for those of you who are sitting here today and all your dad ever did was hurt you to hurt you, I'm just going to pray that by the grace of Jesus, you'll be able to forgive him. <coughs> by, by the grace of God, a bitter root won't get in your life so that it infects your family, especially if you're a father or someday you dream of being a father. <coughs> Last story. Whew. Need my water. <clears throat> Sorry. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 27. Mark chapter 9. <clears throat> I know you're sitting there going, oh man, I wonder if there'll, there'll be any hot dogs left. The youth went out and ate. <laughs> There's love, some left. I went out and checked. Okay, don't worry. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 27. Mark chapter 9. Verses 14 to 27. Buckle in. I'm going to get you there. It's page 1062 in your student Bible. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought, my son, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. 
Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf, mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. You need to know there are several parallel accounts to that. I like the Mark one particularly, but in Luke it does say Jesus gave him back to his father. I love that part. Now you fill in. Godly fathers who wrestle with biblical paradoxes such as decisive yet open to discernment. I do love that part in Luke, but I love even more what we see in verse 24. Hey dads, uh, I'm giving you permission to mark your Bible. Mark your Bible, put a little star in there, highlight it, whatever you want to do. Uh, you should learn verse 24. Most of you already know it because you pray it on a regular basis. Well, just so you know, it's in the Bible. And this desperate daddy said it. You should pray it regularly. As a dad, I never knew how much I'd be making decisions and needing to battle my own unbelief. Consider this dad. His boy is possessed. There's been terrible, life-threatening situations he's had to deal with making critical decisions on a daily basis. Don't let him get too close to the campfire. Don't let him get too close to the lake. It's really hard to imagine how often this man had uttered, God, help me make right decisions. Then he brings his boy to Jesus' disciples. He's deciding to hope that something can happen, that they can help, but they can't. His disciples can't help him. And then, on top of it, a fight breaks out. I bet you this dad is sitting there going, I thought things would get better. They're just getting worse. I'm making wrong decision after wrong decision after wrong decision, and it's just getting worse. But watch very closely. Even though things don't seem to be moving right, his son is getting closer to Jesus. His son is getting a little closer to Jesus. And so something good is going to happen. A year and a half ago, I faced one of the biggest decisions of my life. Whether I should adopt Caden or not. Whether I should let Caden come into our family. While I was open to the wisdom of many, especially my children and my wife, ultimately to allow Caden to come in was mine. Just like this father, I believed I was doing the right thing, but I needed Jesus to help my unbelief, my fear, my anxiety. It's the same today. Huh. You kidding? Before we adopted him, it was easy. Now he's ours. There are more decisions every single day that we have to make as a family and I have to make as a father. I find myself faced with even more decisions about Caden. And I need to be open to Jesus to help me make these decisions about his direction. Friends, that's all that discernment really is. Discernment is just seeking God for His direction and saying, I want your direction. 
I need your direction. And friends, I don't just need it with Caden. I need it with the other two as well. The application for everybody is on your outline. What's the toughest decision your dad had to make? What's the toughest decision your dad had to make? Was it the right decision? Did he choose the right thing? If it was, have you ever blessed him for it? Have you ever said, Dad, I know there was a point in your life that you had to make a really tough decision and you chose the right thing. I want to bless you for it. But maybe he was a flawed father like me and on a regular basis made wrong decisions and messed up. Have you forgiven him? Have you forgiven him for those times that your dad didn't get it right? I hope you can today. Application for dads. Is there a decision that you need God's discernment on? Are you struggling with unbelief right now? That you're just thinking, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know if God is real. I don't know if God cares about my situation. Are you struggling with unbelief? I believe God brought you here today for a reason. Even if it seems like everything has gone wrong up to this point, I believe Jesus has a blessing for you today. If in your heart right now you simply cry out, Oh Jesus, I do believe. Help me with my unbelief. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you so much that you are our Heavenly Father, that you are perfect in every way, that we can look to you and see strong and gentle, willing to hurt, to heal, and so willing to give discernment where it's needed. Lord, for that discouraged dad who's sitting here, I just pray you bless him. I pray you help him to see you and to hear your voice today and in the days to come. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be eternally thankful for you as our Heavenly Father. And, Lord, that we would be thankful even for the earthly fathers that you've given us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done and all that you have yet to do in the strong name of your Son. Amen.